good morning, Oakwood, and welcome this morning as we begin a new sermon series called No Insignificant Story. We're going to be looking at the Christmas story over the next several weeks and really just really diving into what does it mean, what is the significance of all this, you know, and what parts of the story are significant or should be significant to us. And the title of today's message is No Insignificant Place. No insignificant place. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. If you're using one of the Bibles provided there for you, just turn it to page 779. 779, it'll get you right there to Micah chapter 5. As we begin this morning, I just want, I just want you to really think about the Christmas story, all the different parts, all the different facets to it. Because if you, if you really kind of slow down and you don't just say, oh, there's shepherds and oh, there's some angels and oh, there's this, oh, there's that. It's really amazing how all of these things came together to bring about what we would call the Christmas story. And it's no insignificant story. And today, there's really no insignificant place in this story. Because, you know, the place where the story happens was a small town. And, and it laid near the north-south highway that connected Jerusalem to the town of Hebron to the south. And this little town was just about five or six miles to the south. So it would be like kind of from Enid to Wacomas. And, in the, and it was in the shadow of this mighty, ginormous city called Jerusalem. As you approached the town from the north, you descended into this bowl-shaped valley that had foothills rising on both sides, and they were overlooking the fields and the pastures that were down below, where you'd see the sheep and the goats and the shepherds and, and grazing their flocks. This town was so small, though, that they actually listed 102 towns in the official record of the territorial allotment of the tribe of Judah. It's found in uh, Joshua 15. And in there, it doesn't even mention this town. It's so small. 102 towns in the tribe of Judah, in the territorial allotment. It doesn't even mention this place. But Bethlehem, in all of its smallness, was in the plan of Almighty God. And when it's in the plan of God, there's no insignificant place. Let's read our passage together this morning from Micah chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. This is what it says. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure from now, and he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And he shall be their peace. You see, this wasn't an insignificant place, though it seemed that way. I think small towns kind of get that rap sometimes. If you think about small towns, they're kind of an interesting phenomenon. I just want to know, how many of you were originally from a small town, what you call a small town? Okay, we got some small town people in here, so you, you, you'll kind of know what I mean. Small towns kind of have a personality. They kind of have a flavor to them. You got to kind of know what's going on in these places. And if you're from a small town, chances are you are the expert on your small town, Right? You know everything there is to know about, everything about that place. You know all the places in town, and you probably know a lot of the people in town. You know, I was born in a small town. I was actually born in a hospital in uh, Fairfield, Iowa. But I lived in a little town called Stockport. Stockport was a town of about 400 people. And that's where I spent about the first four and a half, five years of my life, was in this town of Stockport. It's in a, it's in a county called Van Buren County, Iowa. And if you go back there today and you happen to go through Van Buren County, you'll, you'll see these signs that say the, vill the villages of Van Buren County because there's not really any towns there. I mean, very, very little there. 
a lot of my family on, on the Woodruff side and the Keller side and the Kisslings, my great-grandparents, they all lived in a little town. It was close to Stockport called Kiosakwa, Kiosakwa, Iowa. Uh, we called it Keo for short. And uh, Kiosakwa had the Des Moines River running right beside it, and my grandparents had a home that was on the Des Moines River that actually just overlooked the river right there. They had a Chesapeake Bay Retriever there that my uncle had one time. They would take sticks, and this, this, the Des Moines River is huge there, and, and it's just a roaring river. And they would take these sticks and throw them out in the middle of the roaring river, and the Chesapeake Bay Retriever would go out to go get the stick. I mean, he'd be just flowing down the river, and you're like, wow, will we ever see that dog again? He's just swimming right out there to go get, you know. You have all these little things like this, all these little nuances and, and all these little character items about these small towns. Things that I know about my small town, where I was from, that I could tell you stories. Things about your small towns that you could tell some stories. You know, Bethlehem was a small town, and it had its own share of interesting things. Let's think back to the Bible about what does it say about this town of Bethlehem? If you remember, it was in Bethlehem where Jacob buried his beloved wife, Rachel, who died while they were moving their flocks to more southern pastures. You might remember that story. It was in Bethlehem where the Moabite widow Ruth and her mother-in-law named Naomi found a kinsman redeemer and a provider in a righteous man of Judah by the name of Boaz. And it was in those fields just outside of Bethlehem that Ruth had gleaned barley and wheat. And the town at that time lived up to its name. If you don't know how Bethlehem got its name, it comes from two words, Beth and Lehem, and it means the house of bread. The house of bread. Hang on to that. That's going to come back in a little bit. And Ruth and Boaz had a grandson who expanded the family's agricultural interests by herding sheep and goats throughout the wilderness. And it opened up to the south and to the east of their village. That grandson was a man by the name of Jesse. Jesse did pretty well for himself. He had a large family and had seven strapping young lads for sons. And no doubt the family of Jesse, they were like big fish in a little pond. But let's admit, this was a very, very little pond. And life in Bethlehem, in that sleepy little village, it certainly changed that eventful day when that prophet named Samuel wandered unexpected into the town. Do you remember that story? The Lord had declared he would replace King Saul on the throne after Saul had displayed a habit of disobeying God's word and disobeying his will and then trying to make excuses for it. And so God had now directed the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem with his anointing oil to anoint the next king of Israel, which was going to be a son of Jesse, whom God had chosen. And as Samuel comes into town, I'm sure it's a big deal because, oh, it's the prophet Samuel. As Samuel comes into town, he looked over Jesse's boys, and he was impressed by the appearance of Jesse's eldest three. Uh, kids by the name of Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema. I mean, they looked great. They certainly looked regal. God stopped Samuel dead in his tracks, though. And before he could uncork that bottle of anointing oil, God spoke these words in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, to the befuddled prophet. And he said this, the Lord does not look at what man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And it's with those words that God voiced one of his modus operandi that we've seen all throughout history, all throughout the biblical record. Uh, Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can follow along on the screens on this one. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You see, God often chooses to use the unexpected, to use the lowly, to do his greatest work. And I want us to hear that this morning, church. I want to hear that as Christians, that God sometimes chose the most unexpected and the lowly to do his greatest work. And so, that day, the prophet Samuel 
chose the youngest son of Jesse. The one who wasn't even there when Samuel came into town and started the initial ceremony. Because he was out with the sheep. He was, you know, a, a shepherd boy. And this little shepherd boy was named David. And from David arose a powerful nation of Israel. But that was then. Because David's descendants and David's people sinned, the nation fell into disarray and was vanquished by enemy after enemy. Like we read in Micah 5.1 just, just a minute ago, sieges were set against Israel and against Judah and her rulers, and they were disgraced. They were struck on the cheek with a rod, is what it says there in the Scripture. I want you to think about this. For 700 years, it's a long time, 700 years. For 700 years, Micah's people, David's people, the Lord's nation had lived Micah 5.1 with the rod hitting their cheek. Wondering, I think, if verse 2 would ever happen, let alone when would verse 2 ever happen. You know, I'm sure by that time, the old highway sign that hung out of town, in its letters that were worn and sun-faded, it said, Welcome to Bethlehem, the birthplace of David. I bet you that seems so long ago and so far away from where they were at this time. You've been to there, you've been to those towns, you know. You roll into Stockport, Iowa, and I think it's this Stockport. Pop, you know, population, 428. Those kind of signs. Hanging outside of Bethlehem. This, this little borough. People went about their quiet ways, unassuming, living these, what we would call seemingly insignificant lives. There just wasn't anything really, really important that was going to happen there. There was nothing of real consequence that ever seemed to happen there. Well, except maybe this, that in its pastures grazed sheep and goats, whose ultimate destiny was someday to be offered at the temple altar, which was just a morning's hike to the north in Jerusalem. But then when you think about it, and you think about Christmas, and you think about Jesus coming, then one night it all changed. In one night, in one moment, Bethlehem became the place where heaven touched the earth. The house of bread now became the place where the bread of life was to be born. And there the good shepherd, the son of David, the son of God, was born. And the place where sheep destined for the endless pattern of temple slaughter became the nativity for the Lamb of God, who once and for all would go to Jerusalem someday and take away all the sins of the world through his own sacrifice. You see, there's no insignificant place when God's involved there. There's no insignificant place when God's involved there. We can look at places and think, these are the least places. These are the places we don't want to be. Some of us, we're going through our lives right now, and that's how we feel. We feel like we're in this insignificant place in our lives. We feel like it doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. The least important places in the Bible produced the Messiah. It produced the first worshipers. It produced the first messengers of his coming. And everything changed because God was there. And when God's there, there's no insignificant place. In fact, things had changed so much that the angel who announced the good tidings of great joy to the shepherds said that the Savior was to be born in the city of David. The city. The city of David. You see, let's go back to the original language. The uh, New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek language had a word for Bethlehem. The word meant a hamlet, a borough, or a small village. The word was kome. But that's not the word that the angels used in Luke 2. Do you remember Luke 2? Do you remember what was said there? And there were in that same country around Bethlehem shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were sore afraid. They were terrified. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, 
For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people everywhere. For unto you is born this day, where? In the city of David. You mean the town of Bethlehem. No, the city of David. A Savior is born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a feeding trough in a manger. The city of David. It was just a town. <laughs> the word that they use there is where we get our English word polis, P-O-L-I-S. That's where we get Indianapolis, Minneapolis, maybe even Metropolis. But it seems that from heaven's perspective, Bethlehem Ephratha looked a whole lot bigger and a whole lot more significant to heaven and to earth. You get this sense from the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. I'm going to put the words on the screen. I invite you to sing it with me. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight you see there are no insignificant places where god's people carry on his mission when god is present there and the people continue to carry on what he wants to happen it becomes a place of significance. I mean, think about your place of significance. Where did you get introduced to the newborn king? Where was it that you heard about Jesus for the first time? For me, I can think of several significant places in my life. I can think of Stockport Christian Church there in Stockport, Iowa. Little congregation that I think maybe runs 60 or 70 on a strong attendance day. That's where I first was introduced to church and first introduced to the name of Jesus as a young, young child. Then I can think of, of Camp Sooner. Camp Sooner in Pink, Oklahoma. Who goes to Pink, Oklahoma to hear about Jesus, right? It's an insignificant place, but it's significant to me because that's where I made my decision to put my faith in Jesus Christ and to accept Him as my Lord and Savior. You can think of places like Oakwood Christian Church a little church here in Enid, Oklahoma that helped me grow and helped disciple me as a young man. Those are significant places. And if you had been there or maybe seen these places, you'd say, oh, it's just an insignificant place. But it's not when God's mission carries on there, when God's people carry on there. Ask you again, where did you first, where, where, where did you first get introduced to the newborn king? For some of you, it may have been at the family reunion. Maybe it was at a coffee shop. Maybe it was talking to someone on a soccer field. Maybe it was a break room at work. Maybe it was a school. Someone after the PTA meeting wanted to talk to you. Maybe it was at a restaurant or maybe a friend invited you to a church. But God wants to work in your seemingly insignificant place to accomplish many things for his kingdom. I want you to get that this morning, that God wants to work in your seemingly insignificant place to accomplish many things for His kingdom. I think that's the way that some of us feel that are in here this morning, is, is my life is insignificant. I mean, I, I get up tomorrow, Monday, and I go to work, and when I get home from work, I, I come home, and, and I, I watch a little television, and I, you know, I eat dinner, and I don't really do anything much meaningful. I may play with my kids, I may go do this, I may go watch something, and then, I'm, I'm going to go to bed, and I get up, I do it all over again. And it's really, it's, it's, it's just insignificant. My, that's the way my life feels right now. It's an insignificant life. There's nothing meaningful, there's nothing exciting that happens in my life. But when you are on mission for God, 
your seemingly insignificant life and your seemingly insignificant place can accomplish many things for the kingdom of God. But your response to God is to submit to Him and to do as He directs you to do in the Scriptures. And then, wherever you go seems to become the significant place. Let's sing the last verse of A Little Town of Bethlehem together. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of His heaven. No ear may hear His coming but in this world of sin where meek souls will receive him still the dear christ enters in a little church of oakwood it stands at 401 north oakwood road We are here in this place and in this time for significant purpose. You may think that Garfield County is not significant to God, but you would be wrong. You see, he put a church right here, his congregation, right here in the center of northern Oklahoma to do his will and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And whether you live in Wacomus or Hennessy, Kingfisher, maybe you live in Ringwood or some little town around, or maybe you live in Enid, he has you in your neighborhood and in your little borough for a reason. He has you at your workplace for a reason. And when believers carry the newborn king into their offices and into their fields and into their schools and into their classrooms and into their homes. Those places, just like Bethlehem, become places where heaven can meet earth again. And Jesus asks us to go and to make disciples. And if you are on that mission, to that end, I'm telling you here this morning, you won't come into church next week and say, oh, my, my life's insignificant. I just get up every morning, do the same thing, go to bed at night, do the same thing. The seemingly insignificant life in the seemingly insignificant place. It's probably because you haven't been accomplishing the work that he wants you to do. And I'm telling you what, if you need some courage, there's no better time of receptivity to the gospel than the Christmas season. People are more open to Jesus Christ than any other time of year right now. We have a whole month ahead of us to share the good news about Jesus. We have unique opportunities like inviting friends to a living Christmas tree to hear the gospel message and the good news about Jesus that way. So many unique opportunities special Christmas Eve services we're going to have. But what are you going to do? Are you going to end in a month and say, wow, that was just the same old thing, different year? Or are you actually going to make a difference and to do something for the Lord? Because He's worthy of not only your praise, but He's worthy of your effort to share His story And you may be thinking, well, God's got me in this insignificant place. I'm here to tell you, God has you exactly where he needs you. And it's not insignificant. Do you understand that the gospel changes lives? The gospel can change someone's eternal destiny. That's significant. You can change the place where they're going to be forever. Because of what you do in your workplace, what you do in your activities, called to be ambassadors, to be representatives of Christ, and to go out into the world and make a difference. And wherever you are, if you take 
the newborn king with you this month, you're going to realize when you're on mission for God, and God's work is being done and his word is going out, there is no insignificant place. Let's pray. God, I thank you for Bethlehem. I thank you that you chose a town like that to bring about the Savior of the world, your son, Jesus. And God, as as we pray right now this morning, Lord, I just pray that this would be a season where we we don't rest we don't, we don't relax. We don't continue in another year with this attitude that's lackadaisical toward the gospel and toward the mission. God, some of us, we don't like the places we work. We don't like the places where we hang out. We don't like the places and the people that we maybe have to share activities with or go to basketball games with. It's because they need Jesus. And we know that, but we're not telling them. So God, I just pray for boldness and courage. I pray for a longing that this could be a significant place, Oakwood Christian Church, where this church family goes out and really makes a difference and really shares the good news and the story of Christmas with all of those that would hear it this month. So God, if we have come in this morning and maybe we are feeling down, maybe we're feeling depressed, maybe we're feeling like we just, we live this little insignificant life and nothing we do matters and we just go through the motions and mark another day on the calendar. God, everywhere that we go, everybody that we touch, could it could be a place of significance if we just remember to be on mission for you. So God, I pray that you would do the changes that you need to do in our minds and in our hearts this Christmas season. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.